Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll, yes, we'll, we'll say good evening to those who are now joining us, yeah. And there's more than just myself and Peter as well. <laughs> there's a few faithful ones here, yeah. Well, last week we were looking at this um, Matthew chapter 24 and we basically stopped round about verse, we discussed verse 9, we talked about how many over the years uh, Christians have been put on trial for their faith and many people in the world suffer for their faith today. And uh, in many ways, Christians are hated and they're hated because they put their trust in the name of the Lord Jesus. We also talked in verse 11 about false prophets who will arise and we've seen over the last 100, 150 years many cases of false prophets and we know that in this world there's, you know, I wouldn't call them denominations or probably sects is the best word, the Jehovah's Witnesses don't call themselves a church, they call themselves a society, which is, you know, Jesus didn't say I come here to build my society, he said I come to build my church. So, you know, as soon as you sort of hear something, it must, you've got to worry, you know, that doesn't ring right. Then you've got the, the Mormons who are, call themselves a Christian denomination, but they have many, many strange beliefs, so, and, and many have been led astray, just as we have here. We also, or well, I said too, that when you read through these passages, you have to realise that certain things are repeated. They, they don't just happen once, but they happen once or twice, and they all point to the, the final picture, the big picture is going to happen. And Jesus promised in the New Testament time and time again that he was going to come again. That's the whole crux of what we believe, that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming again. And so he's talking, his disciples, as we said, they went out, they looked at the big stones and they said, Lord, look at this magnificent temple. He said, well, I'm telling you that one day this will be knocked down. And, and as far as they were concerned, it had to be the end of everything. That was the final thing. So we, we go through this, uh, this talk here. And um, so probably we're up to about verse 12. I think we didn't actually get to talk about Save verse 12. Chapter, chapter. chapter 24, Matthew 24, and we're up to verse 12. Matthew 24, verse 12. And it says there, um, And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. Um, and you have to just think about that, what, what it could possibly mean. The, the, that word um, that is used for love, I think, uh, but essentially it's probably that agape love, you know, agape love, however they... Have you said I'm not well versed in Greek, but and, and I understand that to mean you know that the, the love that God has for us, we have with it's the love you know between us and our Father, you know that kind of love, and what we and what we respond back to Him, and the situation would be that you know things are going to get so bad that many Christians will be worn down by this. You know, we, we look around the world and we, we see what goes on. And many people will just say, it's all getting too much, it's easy for me to give up. And I think we're seeing that, you know, that the, the attendance in church has dropped off. You know, a lot of people become disillusioned. But there's a love that is only available between a true believer and God. And it's a love that sort of binds us up together. You won't find it outside of that relationship. Nobody else will experience that. Um, Romans 5.5, 5. we just quickly look at that. I know it's going to, it is a Bible study, so I don't mind looking at a few references. <laughs> but Romans 5, verse 5. So we just look at that and um, read that through. Have we all got that? Mm -hmm. It says there, And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. And that, as Christians, is what happens, isn't it? But the moment we become believers, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us. And with that comes the love of God. That's part of that relationship that we have. Um, and what Je Jesus is really warning his disciples there, that lawlessness is going to get so bad, things will get so bad, that some people will feel like, or they'll, they'll give up. But I really believe that True Christians, that won't happen to. But there's a lot of people who are almost Christians, if you know what I mean. It's hard to tell them. They might be 99.9% .9 a Christian, if you know what I mean. They've never made that 100% commitment, and that would just be too much for them. And the love of many will grow cold, and they'll turn away. Now, I don't know whether you've got different ideas on that, but that's the only way I can sort of understand that. Um, I, don't know, I don't know what you think. Has anybody got any comments? If you have, by, by all means, you know, chuck them in the pot. But, um, you know... It, 
if you haven't got that love, you can't resist spiritually to what's going on in the world today. Because we look around and basically it's quite devastating some of the things we see. It's, it's pretty awful, isn't it? Um, and we need, we need that love of God within us to be able to fight spiritually and to stand up to what we see is happening. Um, as things get like that, I, I think this can affect us all anyhow, but the love of the Christians might grow weaker. When you continue to find yourself battling against the world, battling against all what goes on, you can probably wax a little bit colder. You, you find it's, it's just too much to maintain that hard fight. Um, you know, um, and, and we do see that today. We do see that today, as we often say, we can remember Sunday school anniversaries a few years ago, that churches were packed. But people have given up. They've disappeared, you know. It's too much for a lot of people, you know. Um, that, and, and, and I think what's happening today as well, and I think it will get more and more, is people are starting to rely on grace too much. I'm a Christian, God knows I'm human, he knows I'll fail, but he will cover all my failings with grace. Whereas really, the more, if we're in a true relationship with love with God, then we should be wanting to please him and really trying to be more and more like he wants us to be as the days go by. But I think for so many people, it's easy to become a little bit lax and, and, and um, taking life more easy than we should as Christians. Um, whatever shows God's love between Christians... I feel in some ways may start to decrease, you know, the things that we do for one another, the things that we do in the church. It, it, as things just get bad, it gets on top of us and it's going to be quite easy to I'm going to take a break. I'm going to, I'm going to take a rest. I'm going to take it a little bit more easy than probably what we should be. Uh, and I don't know um, how, how you feel about that, but I think that there's some evidence of that in the, in the world today and in the church up to a point. I've put down here 1 John 3.11. 1 John chapter 3, verse 11. There's a few little verses that I, I picked out here that I thought might be worth reading. 1 John 3, 11 says this. For this is the message you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, right? And that's the thing. As Christians, we should take, make the effort to love one another. Um, turn over the page, 1 John 4, 20. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And that's a real hard one, because we don't take everybody to heart as somebody we can really love. But we're told we should, because how can we say we love God and we haven't seen if we can't love people that we do see? So th th this is, um, these are quite hard things to, to live up to. But, and I think it's going to be easy to, to sort of go down that path. Well, I, I don't like that person. I don't want to mix with that person or whatever. So it, it, it speaks to all of us. We have to deal with these situations, you know. We have to overcome them in love. I, and I, I believe church rules still have to be obeyed. You know, we can't just disregard church rules and that and cover that all with love. But just because somebody's personality clashes with ours doesn't mean to say we avoid them. We, we still have to love that person. And that's the reflection of God's love to us and our love to God as well. And this is what Jesus talked about. As time goes by, as it gets nearer to them, when things get difficult and the chips are really down, it will be easy to become more isolated and try and look after number one. So that's a warning that we have. I think that, anyhow, you know, I think that's probably what Jesus aimed at. You may see it differently, but I just think that that is a, a warning to us. In verse 13, he says, but, right? And, and, and it begins with the word but, okay? Now, when something begins with but, what does that mean to you? You go along the you go along a <laughs> you go along a track or a line of thought, and then so he says, but it actually means a change of thought, doesn't it? It's actually we're like this. I'm now going to give you a contrast, another way of thinking. So so Jesus is actually saying, but right, right. It signifies something different is going to happen. So what does it say there? But. Um, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. The one who continues it through, the one whose love is sincere, the one whose love is real, that's the one who's going to endure. You know, and we have to ensure that our love is real. We really do love what God says. You know, it's, it's, um, it's so important that we get these sort of relationships right. Because it, it, Jesus actually said, but the one who endures to the end, that means a continuing love, a, a purpose, 
uh, and, you know, single-mindedness that we're going to live the Christian life. It's not wishy-washy or I couldn't care less one day and I care the next. And we see that with some people as well. I mean, I'm not being judgmental, but we do see that in some Christians. We know, as we, people we've met in the past, one minute they're on fire, the next minute they disappear, then they come back all on fire. And you don't really know where you are, what you can trust them with within the church. It's quite difficult. But Jesus says, the one who endures, the one who keeps going, the one who keeps pressing on, you know, that one, will, that one is the one who's going to be saved. You know, and, and we, I think we talked about it, I talked about it the other day with Paul saying, you know, he was in prison, he was about to die, he said, I still press on, you know, it's like the athlete running the race, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm fighting the fight, I'm running the race, the farmer's ploughing the ground, I'm still doing it, I might get the, the prize at the end of all that. So the one whose love doesn't grow cold, the one whose love doesn't just get worn out, those who truly love God, truly love the Lord Jesus are the ones who are going to be saved. And sometimes we don't preach that enough, you know, because we think sometimes we allow people to think, well, as long as I'm doing a little bit, as long as I love Jesus or I love God a little bit, there's a little bit of room for him in my life, that's enough. But it's not, because the moment we become Christians, we actually say to God, you're number one, you are all of my life. But often we, we start to soon relegate to the, to, the, to the nether regions of our life in many ways, really. So that's something else that we, we need to think of. And Jesus is warning us there. Um, we can just look at verses 14 we look well it says and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all ages or to all nations rather and then the end will come well we know that we're getting very close to that stage Jesus said that's going to be one of the signs that history term would be near when this gospel is preached to all nations and for many years there's been little places where the bible hasn't been available in their language Missionary, missionaries haven't quite got there, but I feel that we must be getting really close now to where every part of the world has had the opportunity to hear the gospel and probably read most of the Bible, the important parts of the Bible, in their own language. It must, we must be getting close to that, you know, and there's been a lot of work done by different Bible societies and missionary societies to make sure that's happened. And Jesus says, when that has actually been achieved, we're talking about getting close to him returning again. So we must be getting very close to that, that sort of stage. So then we'll go on to verse 15, the, the real part of what I want to, <laughs> this week's bit, right? <laughs> so ver verse 15 says, So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Dan Daniel standing in the holy place, then he goes on, let the reader understand. What the reader has to understand is what's written in Daniel. Because Daniel writes about this, Okay. And a lot of Christians are not sure what the abomination of desolation is. So we have to read um, what we find in Daniel, right? And so let's just have a little look in Daniel. Daniel chapter 9 to start with. We're not going to do a big study on Daniel because it takes too long, but we, we have read that. Although we didn't do masses of this in our um, you know, in time in church on Sunday morning, because it's more Bible study time, we ought to do a study on that one night. Daniel chapter 9, um, verse 27. And he talks about this here. We'll, we'll look at this a little bit in a moment here. He says, it says there, it's talking about this man, who's this Antichrist, who's going to come into power in the world in the end days. And it says, and he shall make strong a covenant with many for one week. In other words, it seems to me that probably with most of the world, right? And for half of the week, he, and, and yeah, he will put an end to the sacrifice and offering. So halfway through this seven year period, a week of, a week of uh, years, seven days, halfway through, right, he's going to put an end to sacrifice and offering. In other words, three and a half years, he's going to say to the Jews in Jerusalem, there's going to be no more offerings and sacrifices in your temple. Okay? He's going to change things around. And he goes on to change things about. Um, verse, chapter 11 of Daniel, just turn over the page. Um, verses 31 and 32. It says here that forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress and shall take away the regular burnt offering and they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. In other words, he's going to set something up in the temple in Jerusalem that's going to be an abomination. Okay? I, I think from Revelation it's going to be some kind of image. I think most people would agree with that. But he's going to set that up in the temple and it's probably going to be an image to himself. A bit like Nebuchadnezzar made in the book of Daniel when Nebuchadnezzar had a, uh, a 
statue erected of himself and everybody had to bow down and worship the statue. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's going to be that kind of thing that's going to be in the temple in Jerusalem. It's going to be this abomination, right? He will seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant, right? But the people who know their God shall stand firm, right? So there's going to be people in this end time who are going to come to realise that what the Bible says is true and they're going to stand firm by what the Bible teaches, okay? But this man, whoever he's going to be, we don't know who he is at the moment, he's going to set himself up as a God in, in the middle of this last seven weeks of the tribulation. Um, also, I put another verse here. Revelation chapter... Uh, no, uh, just before we get that, uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. Look, it says, And from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate itself, there shall be 1,290 days. If you work back in Bible years, it's exactly three and a half years. So it's in the mid there, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we go up over to Revelation chapter 13. As I say, I haven't gone into this in too much depth because we could be here for ages on this, but at least it gives us an explanation of what Jesus is talking about in this chapter. Revelation 13, verses 14 and 15. It says, and by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast, right? That was wounded by the sword and lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. In other words, this image that is set up in the temple, I don't know how it's going to happen, but it's almost going to come to life. Okay, I mean it seems far fetched. Whether it's going to be actual life as we know life within ourselves, or whether it's going to be some electronic robotic thing, I just don't know how it is. But some, it's, going to, it's going, to, going to come alive and it's going to speak, and it's going to cause everybody to worship this image of this beast. That if you don't, it's going to be death. You know. So this is what Jesus, the Lord, is talking about when you see that. You know, when He says you see these things that Daniel is talking about, the abomination of desolation, let the reader understand, right? And he says, when, and it goes on to the next verse in Matthew 24, verse 16, then, when these things happen, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, right? Let the one who's on the housetop not go down to take what's in his house. Let not the one who's in the field, you know, don't let him turn back to take his cloak. In other words, when you see these things happening, flee for your lives, okay? Now, a lot of this happened at the time of the sacking of the temple in 70 AD when Jerusalem was under siege and, and destroyed by the Romans. But Jesus says, when you see this happen, well, that, the beast was not set up in the temple in 70 AD, okay, and it didn't talk and there wasn't this cause to worship, that didn't happen. And so the things that Jesus are talking about here are yet to happen. But we saw the very same things that Jesus is talking about did happen in 70 AD. As I say, so much of Bible prophecy is repeated and often is the, the final one is stronger than the first one. Okay? We see, as I mentioned, Joseph in prison with uh, the butler and the baker. One dies, one is restored. Jesus on the cross with two men condemned to death. Just the same. One is saved, goes to paradise, and the other one dies. You know? there's, there's just pictures, and, and what we read in the Bible gets emphasised as we go through the Bible, but the final one is the stronger picture, it's, it's much stronger. And so, you know, in, in John's vision and revelation, we saw that the beast, but that was yet to come, that's, that's to come. So we know that when Jesus says you see these things, it's yet to come. Um, we need, or there has to be a third temple to be built in Jerusalem. Now for some reason, I did just write down here, Thessalonians, uh, two, th oh, which was that? Well, maybe we won't go back there because it's going to take too long. No, we won't go into that. It's all about the Antichrist, but we know that, right? But that's still to come. What I would say with regards to this image and um, being able to speak about it, there is a huge rise in the world with the occult. And we don't understand the occult, you know, how, how it works, but we know that very strange things do happen um, when you start dabbling in things that we're meant to steer clear of. Uh, it can have huge effects on people's minds, but strange things do happen. And I remember Doreen Irvin used to say all kinds of things. If you ever went to hear her, yeah. I don't know where she is at the moment or what happened. I have heard different things happen to her. But at the time, she was saying how when she was involved in witchcraft that they could do all kinds of strange things, you know. And 
and uh, I believe that's true. I believe that's true because there's things happen in this world that we don't fully understand. Is that the lady that read that book, that book for witchcraft? Yeah. Christ? Yeah. Yeah. I read that. Yeah. 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 There's, there's, yeah, she came around here as well, but there's been yeah. many other stories about her since. I don't know, but I know what she was talking about things that happened when she was involved in it, and it was sort of mind boggling, really. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's stuff you don't want to get involved with, isn't it? But in Daniel 9.25, you know, if you just look at that, it's where we read. It says that this is going to happen in troublesome times, okay? If you carry on reading what we were reading there about, it said these will happen in troublesome times. So whoever this Antichrist is, is going to rise up as a, as a world leader, probably from sort of obscurity, but in troublesome times. Well, yeah. we are in troublesome times. Do you see what I mean? These things are starting to fit together. Um, as I said last week, you know, there's calls for a one world government to control health. There's calls for a one world government to control the failing economies due to this crisis. You know, the, 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 we've got the chaos of this um, Black Lives Matter movement, really, you know, whatever your point of view on that is, but it's, it's really about collapsing society as we know it and rebuilding again from the ashes, really. So, and there's many other aspects to a one world government that people are called for, environmental things, you know, climate change, yeah, climate change, climate change environment. So you can see that we're, we're starting to move to a, a, a situation where many people are looking for one world guidance. Mm. If this man could come up within the next few years, and I, and I think things might get worse as well before they get any better, probably gonna, we're probably going to go down. If he can come up with answers, who knows what's going to happen in Israel over the next few years? We see a lot of trouble brewing there. And he's got the wherewithal to make some kind of peace treaty for Israel, solve the climate, solve the economic, and solve the health problems. People are going to think he's marvelous. Mm. You know, we're not far from a situation where you can envisage that. Mm. Whereas a few years ago, impossible. But we're, st- you know, I always say, and I said it last week, the scene is being set, the stage is being set. It's getting ready for the curtain to go up. But he's going to be a rescuer in the times of trouble. That's how you read it from Daniel. That, that man is going to come along with the right answers at the right time and he's going to have that charismatic appeal to people. And they're going to look to him and think, yeah, this is the, this is the chap we know. Um, 2 Thessalonians, just look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We'll go to that. There's another reference there if, I can, if anybody can find it, they can read it. Turn the pages over. Two Thessalonians. Two Thessalonians 2, verses 8 to 10. It says, And then the lawless one will be revealed, right? Whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan, with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. In other words, you can see how he's going to come along, this Antichrist, this wicked person, right? With deception, with signs. It's all going to look marvelous. See, it's going to look like to the Jews, he's the Messiah. He's got to be recognised by the Jews as their Messiah. And it's got to be somebody who can perform miracles and appear to be a good chap so much so they think this person is sent by God. If you read through Revelation, you see the rider on the pale horse. Mm-hmm. He's, a, he's a false picture of the one who goes on the white horse. But he's a deceiver, as we go through Revelation. And this is the, the lawless one. He's a deceiver. He's a false Christ. He's the Antichrist and, and his false prophet. Um, as I said, we read in Daniel 9, 27, the middle of the week, he will break the agreement and he'll establish himself, set him up with a, himself up at the centre of a, a new world religion. And I think, you know, we won't be far off. I read two days ago, just caught my eye. I didn't realise that last year, in 2019, that the Pope went to Egypt and made an agreement with the uh, Islamic leader there. It's called, it's some world um, agreement uh, of peace of religions. And um, a few days ago, there was a call for, from the Pope for people to pray to God, to pray to um, Allah, or whatever your God is, or whatever the being, or whatever entity you worship, for a, a, a finish to the coronavirus. So, I mean, 
The Pope, is, he calls himself the Vicar of Christ, he's here on behalf of God, he's saying that people pray to whatever you believe. Yeah, and this is dangerous ground because we're looking for a one world, go, a one world religion that everybody can be part of. It. And people in San Francisco, it could be the New Age, you know, where it's paganism, it could be Catholics, it could be Hindus, it could be whatever. All mixed together, whatever that, whatever way you want to view that religion, or your God, that's okay, we'll all fit together with that. And as we looked on that video I showed about the, when they opened the tunnel, and we saw yeah. people dancing, you see how people are accepting all the old kinds of religion and beliefs. So we're moving rapidly to days where these things are possible. Mm. You know, and, and it really is our generation that's seeing these things. I, I really do believe that we are starting to see these things. And so this new world religion might not be far down the road. So we have to... That's why it's so important that we keep reading our Bibles and we know what the Bible says and we stick with it because once you start going off in one area, you go into another and you go into it and you go into another. Before you know it, you're off track. So it's very important that we're guided by the Word of God. Yeah, we might think it's a bit strict and narrow maybe, but it's the only safe thing we've got. You know, man's interpretation of it is not good. Um, and what I'm saying to you tonight, you need to go home and read it and see what you think. You know, don't just believe what I'm telling you, but read it for yourselves. We all have to do that. We just go back to verse 16, right? Now, Jesus is still talking to his, to his disciples, and he says, So when you see the abomin of des abomination of desolation, spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, right? Which is yet to come, right? Let the reader understand. Then let those who are in the man flee. Uh, let those ones who's on the housetop not go and take, you know, don't go back to your house, don't go and collect things, just get out, all right? Well, we know that in, in the siege of Jerusalem, because people heard what Jesus got to say, Christians believed the Bible, right? They were looking for the immediate return of the Lord Jesus, the early church. When they saw this war with Rome coming up and all what was happening, the Christians did flee from Jerusalem and they were saved. So you've got the reenactment of this back there. They actually observed what Jesus said when they saw Jerusalem surrounded. And it's going to happen again. Okay? That, but the, the church was spared because they believed this and they went away from it. And it was the Jews who stayed behind refusing to believe Jesus were the ones who died. What did I say? 1.4 million of them. 1.1 million died. But the church basically got out and fled to the uh, surrounding countries and they were saved. And when they saw these warnings and they were off. Right? But Jesus says here that um, he goes on to say, pray that your flight might not be in the wind. Look, you don't want to go when it's snowing and, and, and cold and the roads are bad on a Sabbath because to strict Jews you could only do a Sabbath day's journey, mm. which was a short distance, not enough to really um, get your way, you know, without breaking law. And he says, because look, such has not been from the beginning of the world until now, and now will never be, right? So the tribulation that is to come is going to be the worst ever. And it's still to come. So we saw what the Jews went through at the, the siege of Jerusalem. We saw what they went through at the Holocaust, which is another picture of this. But the worst is yet to come. It's going to be terrible. When, when all the nations gather around Jerusalem for the Battle of Armageddon, which is yet to come, it's going to be the worst ever. Yet we've seen the chilling things that have happened. You know, the, the Jews were crucified on crosses all around the earthworks, all around Jerusalem, when the, when the Romans seized Jerusalem. They starved them to death. Mothers were eating their babies, as we read earlier in the Old Testament of um, people doing that. But at the siege of Jerusalem, they ate their babies. And it was dreadful. And yet that's only a, a small picture of what is to come. And when you just when people think, oh, I'm not worried about all this, I don't care, I'm going to take my chances. People don't realise just what they're talking about, you know, what they're dealing with. And we're so close to so much of it starting to happen, uh, um, you know, happen really. Um, yeah, um, as I say, the, the siege of Jerusalem was truly terrible, right? And it will be repeated. What, what's verse 21? Oh, we've looked at that, haven't we, quickly? Yeah, it's. Yeah, okay. Um, verse 22, look, what do, you, what do you make of verse 22? It says, And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved, right? It's going to be so bad that probably the world would destroy itself. And now we. Over since the last 50, 60 years, we have the capability mm -hmm. of the world destroying itself. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Now I've got my explanation for this from Patty. <laughs> because I said, it seems the elect will be there in the tribulation. I've always tended to think that we'll go before the tribulation. 
But she put me right. She said, well, you've got to remember there's two elects in the Bible. <laughs> right? There's Israel, who are the elect in the Old Testament. But there's the church that is the elect in the New Testament. And we're dealing with the 70-week period. The 69 weeks will be up. At the church, the rapture will come with the church. Will then God starts dealing with Israel again, which is the elect from the Old Testament period. So he's back with that elect. Do you understand what I'm saying? We, we, deal with, we, we, we go through the 69 periods, that's gone. We've got a gap called the church age. Seven week period will come where God starts to deal with the Jews again. So we're the elect at the moment, it's 2,000 years of church age. But the, the elect that Jesus is talking, and he's talking to the Jews at the time. Mm-hmm. They knew they were the elect, so he's now back to um, dealing with the Jewish people. And so he said, if it, if it wasn't for the fact that God had chosen Israel, chosen the Jews, that Mankind would probably be wiped out. There wouldn't be anybody who who's going to survive that. Um, you know, it, it, it's a, a horrible situation, isn't it? Really, the the old the first covenant is going to come back into being for that period. Mm. The Jews are going to be under that covenant. Our covenant was Jesus said, "I've given you a new covenant, a new agreement." That's what we celebrate at communion, isn't it? Mm. But when the church goes, that agreement goes with that covenant goes with us, and we get back to the old one. And so, the Jews will be under that, right? And, and you know, many Jews will start to realise then exactly what's happening. This is what the Christians have talked about. You know, this is what the New Testament talks about. And not just the Jews, but many people alive in the world will start to realise that we've been telling them the truth all the way along. And that's why we come up with things like the Tribulation Saints. You know, we've heard people talk about it. Those who are saved during the Tribulation. Um, just look at Revelation chapter 7, verse 4. We won't go on for too much long, it's a lot to take in. <laughs> we'll look on the next bit next week. Revelation chapter 7, verse 4, right? This is what John sees. Revelation 7, verse 4. She's crawling through the She's crawling. Oh, she's crawling under there. I covered my legs out of the. That's fairly. I think we're fairly. Yeah, fairly yeah, yeah. 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 So, so John is in heaven and it says in verse, chapter 7 verse 4 it says I heard the number of the seal 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel which Jehovah's Witnesses claim as their elect the next few verses up to verse 8 tells you there are 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel making 144 right mm-hmm. then verses 9 on it says and I, and I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne, and around the elders, and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne, and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honour and power and might be to our God for ever and ever. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and where have they come? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. These are people who are going to be in heaven, but they're saved out of the tribulation, the time of the tribulation. Not the church, but it's going to be 144,000 Jews at least, maybe some evangelists who go around during that time, but other people who are saved through the suffering of the tribulation. Not the church, they're not the church. But they're the tribulation saints and they're different to us because we're not saved through the tribulation. We're saved through the blood of the Lord Jesus. They will be too, but we're going to be saved before that. So there will be, there will be people saved in the time of the tribulation. So, you know, we need to tell people because even if they don't believe now, if we're the ones that are gone, they'll be the ones who will remember our words. This is exactly what they told me about. This is exactly what I heard. They were waiting for this to happen. This is what they believed. And I've been left behind. What hope is there for me now? Well, endure what's going to go on. Endure the hardship, endure the pain. And there's a, you know, there's a chance you could be saved. You know, the, the, the offer that Jesus made that for us now, it may be not quite as easy for them later on, but it's still a chance one or two could be saved in one form or another. I don't think they'll be part of the church, as we are, but they'll be, they'll be saved from you know, eternity in hell. But that's another whole Bible study that is in there. Um, so, it's, it, it, you know, but these things are on the doorstep almost, you know. 
Um, verses, we'll just go to verses 23 and 24. Just finish off just reading these, right? Um, he then goes on saying, that, look, then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, don't believe it. Right? When people will say that, don't believe it, because it's not, he's not going to be hidden up here, it's not going to be hidden up there, it's not going to be, you'll find Jesus here or there, right? He says, for false Christ and false prophets will arise, they'll perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect, right? If possible. It's not possible. If you're truly saved, you will not be led astray. Okay? God won't let that happen. Right, we belong to God, and he says, no one can pluck them out of my hand. Mm. Okay? But you know, if it were possible, but it's not, okay? Um, just look at Romans 8, 31 to 39. We'll just finish up with these little thoughts, really. Romans 8, 31 to 39. It says there, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us, right? In other words, whoever comes up against us, God's on our side. Yeah. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Jesus, Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised and who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, as it is written, you know, and you know these verses, but there's nothing that will separate those who belong to Jesus from him. We really belong to him. It doesn't matter if people come and try and deceive us, whatever they try and do, if it were possible, but it's not possible, right? And um, I've just put here, if we read these words, we've been warned, haven't we? We have been warned, you know. Jesus actually says that, look, I'm telling you, you've been warned. So these are things to think about, and as I say, we read them for yourselves, and don't just get what I think, because you may see things, things a little bit different, we can always discuss that another time, but these things are so close to happening now, aren't they? It's so close to, uh, it's all possible, mm. it's all possible, it's not all pie in the sky anymore, but we are getting near to where so much of this is going to become a reality, and I believe quite soon, we are that generation that so many Christians down the centuries have looked for the return of the Lord Jesus. And I think, you know, we're almost within reaching distance of it, you know. So that's quite an incredible thing, really, isn't it? So let's think about these things. Read it, not get frightened, because it's, it's you know, we're in God's hands, and he's going to look at our preacher and us. Whatever happens to us, we're with him. So mm. it, it's, it's something to be joyful about, isn't it? You know, we sing about it. Come, Lord Jesus, don't we? We sing to him. So let's, you know, live up to that. But read, go home and just read. There's only a few verses there. But just read it through a few times and get it in your head and in your heart and in your mind and, and, and think about it. And... Next week we'll go on to the next little bit, just to go through this uh, chapter 24. There's, a, there's another little, couple of little blocks to go through just to finish that chapter off. So we'll do that next week, yeah? Yeah. 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 yeah.